This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 6th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, we only get to two of our top three. First, we are down to the end game on the PFD. Is there a plan B if, as highly likely, we aren't able to achieve the level of spending cuts necessary to restore it? And second, why the push by Saudi and Russia to involve the U.S. in oil production cutbacks is relevant to Alaska. And now, let's join Michael. This morning's three are kind of, uh, I mean, they, they, I don't know if we're going to get to number three. I mean, I really would like to, but we're, we're, we got a number one that is deep and wide and full of holes. And we need to start there because it's already clear that they are coming for the rest of the PFD. I mean, you can see it in the op-eds that are coming out. We're going to talk about those. And that, uh, you know, that there is just no interest and no love for any kind of future cuts to government uh, and that they are gunning for this PFD. Let's talk about it. Well, Michael, I think what the what the COVID-19 has done and the economic shutdown that we're that we're in uh, and the oil price decline um, or crash uh, that we've suffered, uh, what all that has done has fast forwarded a debate that we were going to have over the next two to three years anyway, but but put it all in this year, in this in this upcoming session. And and that's going to be this. Uh, we, we, we don't have enough revenues to afford the government we have uh, by a wide amount. The, the state finally came out with the spring revenue forecast uh, yesterday, and it confirms what uh, what uh, legislative finance had said during the last days of the session that that we're just I mean, we don't we don't have revenues to support the government we have um and the, and the question now is going to be how do we how do we wh what do we do about that clearly some are pushing for uh spending cuts a lot on this a lot that listen to this uh, uh broadcast are pushing for spending cuts but that's certainly not universal and if you look at the op-ed page uh, uh facebook pages of various representatives you see that they have diametrically opposed plans on how to deal with this. It's not that their plans are not to cut government, uh, uh, if any, uh, but not much, if any, um, and to fund uh, the difference uh, through uh, taxing the full PFD, taking the full PFD. Zach Fields had, a, uh, had an op-ed that said exactly that uh, over the weekend, um, uh, which is sort of ironic because Zach Field comes from Zach Fields represents one of the poorest districts in the state. Uh, but then you flip to the other side, one of the wealthiest districts in the state, Chuck Kopp's district. And Chuck Kopp essentially said the same thing uh, in his op-ed. Right. Those follow a Facebook post by Bryce Edm Edgman last week where he said the same thing. So <laughs> while many, <laughs> many on, on certainly listening to this broadcast and many uh, elsewhere say the solution is to cut government spending Dramatically, and it would have to be dramatically. We're talking about a cut of in excess of 1.5 billion, more than a third um, uh, of the, um, or roughly a third of state spending, all in one year. Um, while while some propose that, you're seeing legislators uh, coming out uh, in the in the opposite uh, direction. Well, and this is all going to come crashing in next year. We we don't have. We've run through the SBR. We've run through the CBR. 
the ERA, uh, frankly, should be off limits uh, because that's part of the investment base for future Alaska generations. There's some who want to go tax future generations by taking from the ERA, but at least in, in my opinion, it ought to be ought to be off limits. Um, and and so we're going to come crashing into the next session, and and we're gonna we're gonna have this debate, and we're gonna, frankly, probably decide this debate for 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 generations yet to come about whether we whether we solve this through taxing the PFD or we solve it in some other fashion. And my point, <laughs> the point I've been making the last couple, few days, um, and I think it's a critical point, is I understand that there are those who think. Uh, the solution to this is to cut government spending, as I said, dramatically, a third uh, of government spending in, in one year. I understand that. Uh, but we went through that debate a couple of years ago, and it didn't come out the way we wanted. And if you look at the composition of the legislature, even the likely composition after this election cycle, uh, it's unlikely that they're going to cut a third uh, of state spending uh, in one highly unlikely that they're going to cut a third of space, state spending in one year. So here's here's the question I think that those who advocate for spending cuts need to confront. What's your plan B? If they don't, if if we can't cut spending to that level, what's your plan B? Because because it's clear that that many in the legislatures their plan B is to just cut the PFD, just eliminate the PFD, tax the PFD, convert that to government, uh, and keep on going. And if you convert to if you convert the full PFD to government. You get close uh, to, to being able to continue to fund uh, current spending levels. That's their plan B, and they've already got it in place, and they're already working on it. Right. So the question now to our leg to the legislators who have who have and and to people who have pushed for spending cuts for the last eight years, like you and I have, have pushed for spending cuts for the last eight years. We're going to be up against it in this in this coming legislature. And the question is, what's your plan B? If you don't have one, um, and and you sort of risk it all you put all the chips on on spending cuts um and that doesn't go then what's going to happen is 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 the pfd is going to go that they're going to tax the full pfd convert it to government uh and that's how they're going to continue to fund we've talked about a plan b we've talked about the flat tax others have talked about other things but but it's come time to have a plan b to have a plan b and to, and and to and to be and be talking about a plan, right? Right. Because because it's going to be very it's going to be a very compact legislature next year. Can we can we dissect a couple things about what you just said here? Because I mean, first and foremost, like you said, Zach Fields, Chuck Cop, Bryce Edgman, they've all put these op eds out. They've all put Facebook posts out. The uh, the thing that gets me the most is, as you said, they seem to be completely polar opposites of what we're seeing in general in the public. In fact, their own Facebook pages are overwhelmed with comments from people who are, you know, again, just diametrically opposed to what they're doing. So, I mean, I think that there's an amount of tone deafness here that that is astonishing. Um, I wanted to point out a couple comments in, um, in, in these op-eds, too. Um, you know, one of the ones that really stood out to me was Zach Fields. Right in the middle of his op-ed, he says... Prior to the COVID-19 virus, our fiscal challenges were daunting, but not an emergency. Which, if, wow. I don't know what he's been watching. Uh, it was He must have been watching some sitcom instead of, uh, you know, instead of, uh, uh, you know, the 24-hour the, the news cycle. Because this thing has been an emergency for the last three or four years. Because when you penciled it out, you saw that we were doing nothing but spending from our savings and not seeing it. But now it's an emergency. And of course, never let a crisis go to waste. Now it's an emergency prior to COVID. Um, the second thing he mentions is that down at the bottom, he compares this to the past where he says, back in 1950s, when Americans from all over moved into Alaska, we had nothing, no oil tax revenue, no tax base, and essentially no infrastructure. People moved here because Alaska symbolized hope and because Alaskan believed the future could be bright. They also moved into Alaska not believing that the government would take care of everything. I mean, I will remind you, when we got that first $900 million payment, the state budget was $157 million for the whole state. So, I mean, there is there is a disconnect here, Brad. And while I agree with you that they have a plan and they are moving forward with it, and we continue to just kind of bark at this tree, um, I mean, this just, to me, kind of shows that disconnect between Alaskans and their supposed leaders. Well, it's a disconnect between some Alaskans and, and their supposed leaders. I mean, certainly there is a strong contingent of Alaskans that believe, that have believed, 
uh, for the past uh, uh, eight years that the solution to this is spending cuts. Um, and it's not it's not that you don't know where the spending cuts need to be made. That's been that's been fairly clear. Governor Dunleavy uh, identified a lot of that uh, uh, two years ago when he came out with his with his initial budget. Uh, but but when you when you go through the legislature and you go through each each legislator, they all have. I mean, we've had this discussion before. They all have something that that they don't want cut. We can go back to the uh, Arts Council. I mean, there were Republicans. It, it, there, there were there were less than 16 Republicans willing to hang on and say, cut the Arts Council. Right. I mean, it, 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 right. It, 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 it bounced back. And and you go through the legislators, legislators, and you've got sixty, you got sixty legislators. They each have some minimum, something that can't be cut. For a lot, it's the university. For a lot, it's K through twelve. For others, it's Medicaid. You go, you go through. For for some, it's roads. For some, it's the arts council. Uh, you go through the legislature, and there's just not. We we found two years ago, there's not sixteen who will back up the governor. Uh, when he when he proposes to make those those deep cuts, and he was he was only proposing to to cut a billion uh, uh, two years ago. We need a billion five just to get just to break even. Right. Um, so it's I, I mean yes, there there are a lot of people in this state that that say cuts cuts. I mean I see it on my Facebook page. I'm sure you see it on your Facebook page. I'm sure Bryce and Zach and and cops see it on their Facebook page. But there's not a consensus on what to cut, and in the absence of a consensus of what to cut, as we saw uh, two years ago, there there aren't cuts. Um, the other thing about about Zach is the reason it's an emergency now. And, and I got I got to tell you, I got to chuckle when Zach talks about why Alaskans came in 1950. Zach Fields moved here in 2013. <laughs> he, he's only been here seven years. So so let's 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 not spend a whole lot of time thinking about what Zach Fields thought about why Alaskans moved here. Right. Zach 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 Fields moved here because he's a Mike Gravel, because he sees it as a as a place to make, you know, political gains more easily than living in or than staying in Virginia, which is where he came from. Right. Um it it's it, it, when he says it's an emergency now, what he means is this. Even if you spend the whole PF, even if you convert the whole PFD, even if you tax the entire PFD and move it over to government, you still don't have enough money to, to continue funding uh, current spending plus inflation. So, so what's what the emergency to him is, is even if he takes the, he didn't think it was an emergency before now because he just kept taking pieces of the PFD. Just visualize that he would just keep keep taking more and more of the PF, taxing more and more of the PFD um, uh, for the next two or three or four or five years. Uh, the, the emergency to him is even if you take the entire PFD, there's not enough to support spending levels. So that's, I mean, and, and that's true. And, and, and what's true is this. What's true is this. At a billion five or a billion six or a billion seven, which is which is where we are in terms of the deficit, um, you, you've got to, you're going to have to tax something. There's an, there's an emergency uh, in the sense that if you try to maintain these spending levels and, and, We've had the discussion about why people maintain the spending levels. You try to maintain these spending levels, you are going to have to tax something. So it's an emergency to Zach, and it's, it's an emergency to COP. We're down to it. I mean, what, what, the, what COVID and the, and the oil price drop has done has, has brought forward a debate we could, have, we could have had over the next two, three, four, or five years. It's, it's brought it into next session. Right. And, and as I say, those who want spending cuts, fine. You and I have talked about spending cuts. You can outline where they are. You can say it's the right thing to do. But if you don't have the votes for spending cuts, what's your plan B? Is your plan B uh, to raise those revenues through PFD cuts as COP and Fields and others uh, are, are pushing? Or is your plan B something else? If you don't have a plan B, you're just defaulting into PFD cuts. Well, and I think Zach Fields is outlining exactly what the future is going to look like for their plan B because he said we will have to simultaneously keep public services lean raise substantial new revenue, and probably forego PFDs for multiple years into the future, potentially indefinitely. So that's the PFDs gone, raise substantial new revenues, which is some form of tax beyond a PFD tax, and continue with government services. I think that is the plan. COP says something, <laughs> echoes something similarly. I mean, this is this is the way they're, where they're going. 
and, and and what Fields, I mean, you gotta you gotta look at Fields' statement. What Fields is saying is he really doesn't care who pays the burden. Not only, and this is a guy who comes from one of the one of the poorest, one of the lowest income districts in the state. What he's really saying is tax the PFD, which is, has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families, particularly families in his district. Um, and then and then we're going to need some other taxes. And he mentioned sales taxes. Sales taxes are the second most regressive approach to taxes uh, than uh, to, to PFDs. PFDs are first most regressive. Sales taxes are second most regressive. Adversely impact uh, middle and lower income fa- Alaska families more than more than the top 20 percent. Push the burden of middle and lower income Alaska families. It, basically, he's saying, I don't care if my if my constituents get hurt in this. I want to raise. We, we need to raise. Uh, we need to raise these revenues. It's, it's just. I mean, it's just sort of astonishing at how these people are writing off their own people from the poorer districts are writing off uh, their own constituents. But they're nonetheless doing that. Yeah. And if anybody thinks Zach Fields is is going to be defeated in the next election cycle, there hasn't. There isn't even anybody who's running against him that I that I've seen yet. Right. Right. And that's what we're facing. I was talking with Shelley Hughes the other day, and she has talked about this kind of silent you know, majority, the sleeping giant kind of thing. And I have poo-pooed this up until the point where everybody's been stuck at home and all of a sudden it seems like more people are starting to pay attention. But I'm afraid that it might be too little too late, Brad. Too little too late for these folks to wake up and realize that they've been rooked for the last four years and they just been they've been asleep at the switch and not paying attention and all of a sudden it's too late to stop the bus yeah it's it's too late and i mean that's part of it part of it is 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 this silent majority has never coalesced around around you know election time they've never coalesced around electing people in districts where it matters chuck cops district jennifer johnson's district zach field's district Bryce Edgman's district. They've never coalesced around candidates uh, that 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 would move the needle, that would that would that would make the cuts uh, necessary uh, to be made. And unless you, I mean, yes, I mean the Matsu, they, they win, right? So you got Laura, you've got Shelley, you've got Mike Shower, you've got David Wilson in the Matsu. You've got a delegation that would make the cuts, and you know they win by astounding numbers. Uh, no doubt uh, on on those issues, but in the dis- but in the rest of the state, which which controls the legislature, in the rest of the state, uh, you just don't have that that sort of movement um, uh, uh, in in the election cycle to replace legislators that uh, that are that are at the margin. I mean, you've got people, you've got like Sarah Rasmussen in, in West Anchorage, uh, who didn't back up the governor uh wasn't part wasn't part of of a movement to support the 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 billion dollars in cuts the governor proposed making um and you and you can sort of look around the rest of the state there just isn't that depth of of support for that movement to to change out those legislators so yeah i mean among this listening audience in 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 the in in the pockets where where spending cuts are are strongest in in matsu and elsewhere uh, yeah, you've got people who are rabid, who are riled up, who are you know all over Facebook. Right. Uh, but it's not spread broadly spread enough to, to to move the dime. Right. Well, and we didn't even get to the uh, story uh, that James Brooks wrote talking about the spring revenue forecasts uh, projecting this budget deficit even with a zero PFD. Um, and it, I guess it doesn't help that the news media seems to be um, satisfied with just kind of. You know, rephrasing press releases from the majorities and not really asking questions, not really bringing up the fact, you know, talking about the the past spending and how we burn through the savings. And, and I'm not saying doing it from a partisan standpoint. James Brooks writes some pretty good stuff, you know, a lot of times. But it's very obvious that in this that there is no real deeper analytical thought, no investigative journalism as to what's gone on here. And it, it hurts when you don't have. Uh, a a you know a, a fifth a fifth estate that is able to go out there and and take a look at this and and really analyze it, Michael. You know, part of that is, and maybe we want, we want to talk about this when we go back on the air. But part of that, I've had conversations with James and with and with Nat Hertz and with others about that about that very issue. Why don't you talk about alternative revenues? Uh, why don't we compare and contrast? Uh, uh, impacts on other people, and the response is very simple: No, 
no elected officials will talk about that. No elected officials think that's a big issue. You know, Brad, you're sort of you're sort of off on an island. And 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 so what they're doing is they're reflecting what elected officials are talking about. And and as I and as I've said before, and and, and I'm saying again now, uh, those who believe in spending cuts don't have a plan B. So you know it's fairly easy for James to write if if, if all he's looking toward is elected officials. Um, it, 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 if, if that's all he's looking for, it's fairly easy to write the story. This is what Chuck Kopp wants to do. This is how Chuck Kopp's going to going to close it. This is what Ben Carpenter wants to do. He wants to he wants to do all spending cuts, and 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 that's sort of it. And as I say, you can't get 16 to support even a billion dollars in spending cuts, much less the billion five or the billion six or the billion seven that we're that we're facing in the next legislature. So it's, I mean. It, it it reflects what our those stories are reflecting what our legislators say. I mean, I talked to James, I talked to Nat, I talked to uh, to, to others, um, but it's it, it's not getting picked up in the stories because the legislators aren't talking about it. You know, the problem is, it seems like to me, in a lot of ways, the news media is kind of complicit because they're just kind of reporting on what the legislators are talking, about, what the politicians are talking about, and they're not providing both sides of the issue. Is what I'm saying. And Brad, you're saying that's to be expected since that that's where they're getting their information. Like I said, I mean, James and and Nat would say, "Hey, I'm talking to legislators." And the legislators, there's a lot of legislators who say tax the PFD into 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 you know into dust. I mean, take the full PFD. And there's legislators who say spending cuts or tax future generations by taking it out of the ERA. There's really there's that's it. I mean, that's really sort of what legislators are saying. So we're their response would be we're writing about what legislators say. Um, uh, yes, Brad. Or, or others, yes, you've got uh, different ideas, but legislators aren't saying them, so they, they have they they have no reality. They have they're they're not they're not uh, things that that potentially can pass. Or not, there's not a plan B out there that legislators are talking about. So I mean, we're going into this next session, and 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 again, we've es we, we've moved this this issue forward. It was going to play out over the next two or three or four years. It's going to play out next year because of what's happened with oil prices. Um, we're going into it with. A pocket, a, a big pocket that says we're going to cut the PFD into into dust. A pocket that says no, no, you got to do it through spending cuts. Sort of nothing in the middle, and it's and so it's a it's an all or nothing. Nobody, nobody's come, nobody's bringing forward uh, a plan B that uh, that that would that would resolve the issue uh, short of either a more than a billion five in spending cuts, which frankly, folks, isn't going to happen. Uh, or uh, complete PFD cuts. I want to get on to number two, but let me just let me just bring up one thing, and this is, I think, the biggest fear. It's my biggest fear. It's one of the reasons why I haven't jumped fully on board with what you're talking about, uh, is because uh, you know it, believing that new revenues won't create new demand for government services, or that new revenues will not be consumed by the voracious appetite of legislators. Now you have said. You know, we'd like to do it. We could put something in, but it's statutory, so it doesn't really matter. My fear is their track record has already shown that they will consume everything in sight. So if we generate new revenues, there's nothing to say that they wouldn't just spend everything. They're not going to they're not going to develop fiscal restraint by giving them new revenues on top of this. Um, well, as I've said, Michael, every every proposal I've made um, and they're all on the record begins with. Uh, preserving the PFD at uh, POMV 5050, um, and that's 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 the beginning point. So, the the new revenues I talk about, the the replacement revenues I talk about, are in fact replacements, uh, a replacement for PFD. Um, if 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 you don't start from that, if you if you if you don't start from that and say, by God, we're going to find an effective way, and and we can BERT. Uh, to use a phrase, we can Bert Stedman some 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 cross ties into the legislation to make that effective, even though it's statutory to make that effective. We can use some of Bert's tricks to to make that effective. If if you say, well, I'm just not even going to go down that road because I just don't want to talk about alternative revenues. I just don't want to talk about new revenues. Then fine, you're just you're you're the only plan out there is going to be PFD cuts. It's going to be the elimination of the PFD. You're doing a Hail Mary on being able to do a billion five in spending cuts. And if you fail in doing that, fail in doing any of that, because it takes it take would take all of that to restore the PFD, um, even at POMV 5050. 
if you fail in any of that, uh, the, the only plan B that sits out there is to, is, to, is to take the PFD. So my response to that is I've put in bells and whistles. If you think there need to be more bells and whistles, let's put in more bells and whistles. I've, I've thought of some. I can draft them. I can stick them in, in, into the statute. But, but if, if you're just never going to be satisfied with that, if you're always going to think that alternative revenues are bad, then fine. What you've done is you put all of your all of your chips on on spending cuts. If those don't happen, then then the only other plan out there is is taking the PFD, and that and that's the bet you've made. Right. Um, we we can do the alternative, and 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 again we can bert the alternative by 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 sticking in all sorts of bells and whistles that make it effective. But if you don't want to go down that road, fine. It's it's all or nothing on. Uh, on, on doing spending cuts. Jim sends in questions for you uh, here via email this morning. Is there some way to convince the legislature to spend within the limits of our income? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we just do a segment on that? I think we've been doing a segment on that for five years, Brad. I think we have been doing five years worth of segments on how do we convince the legislature to spend within the limits of our income? And well, you, you got to understand the legislature thinks a, a, a big segment of the legislature thinks the PFD is part of their income. So when 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 I say sustainable budget, I mean traditional revenues. When Zach Field says sustainable budget, he means traditional revenues plus the PFD. Right. Um, so it's yeah, they are. I mean, a lot of them are uh, spending within what they think the limits of their of of the of their income is. And that's, I mean, that's the debate. We're, we've not, no, we've not pushed for a plan B. Those, those who push on spending limits have not pushed for a plan B saying, you know, don't, don't cut the PFD. Here's an alternative revenue source. And, and frankly, if you had an alternative revenue source that, that hit Natasha von Imhoff and hit Chuck Kopp's, uh, 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 constituents, they would push for spending cuts. Right now, they don't care about spending cuts because their constituent using PFD cuts as a way to finance the government. Their constituents aren't impacted. The top 20% aren't impacted. So it's, it's I mean, you, you're not going to get the legis- you're not going to get that segment of legislator legislators to push for spending cuts until it hits them and hits their constituents. <clears throat> and it's not going to hit them and their constituents until it's something different than PFD cuts. Um, Brad, you're probably joined now with probably the most friendly, hostile audience that you're going to have when it comes to your thoughts on this plan B. So take a minute or two here and make the final pitch to these people. Cause I mean, I'm telling you right now, most, you know, most of us who are here on the program in the chat room, we are hesitant to give any new revenue for the reasons that I outlined earlier. Um, and we believe that, you know, the cuts need to come first before the new revenue is generated. And so there's a lot of things. And I agree with you that there has to be some kind of plan B because other we're obviously being overwhelmed. But hit, hit the people in the chat room. Like I said, the most friendly, hostile crowd you'll get. Um, you know, hit us with your with your two minute elevator pitch on why we need to stop you know, thinking exclusively a linear, you know, one track mind, so to speak, and we need to branch out and come up with an alternative just in case. Okay. Spending cuts aren't coming. I I know that's a harsh reality. I know a lot of you disagree with it, but spending cuts aren't coming. We, We tried that two years ago. It failed. Spending cuts aren't coming. The alternate, the only alternative on the, on the table right now is, is PFD cuts, PFD taxes, PFD elimination, um, instead. And, and that's what we're facing. That's where the legislature has gone the last five years, four years. Uh, and that's where if you if you read the tea leaves, if you look at what these people are saying, that's where the legislature is going to go ahead. So if you if you say if you say, well, if I don't get spending cuts, I'm willing to accept PFD cuts, then you're fine, because that's where the that's where the legislature is going. PFD cuts. The reason I don't accept PFD cuts is they have the largest adverse impact on both the Alaska economy and Alaska families. They're, they're heavily tilted, pushed. They push the costs to middle and lower income Alaska families. I don't think that's right. It's neither equitable, nor is it good, nor is it the right answer for the Alaska economy. And by God, if anything right now, we need to be, we need to be doing things that support the Alaska economy, not make the Alaska economy worse. There are alternatives that are better more equitable for Alaska families than PFD cuts, and uh, better for 
uh, the overall Alaska economy, have a lower impact on the on the Alaska economy. Yes, they they gener they are alternative revenues uh, to uh, uh, in, in the sense that they do raise revenues from from Alaskans, but they're an alternative to PFD cuts, not an addition to PFD cuts. And we can put in bells and whistles to make sure that's that that that's, that, that stays solid. You can put in <clears throat> conditions just like Bert did right. um, in, in the CBR draw. Uh, Shonda says in the chat room, I understand that, not going to stop asking to cut, sorry. And I don't think anybody's asking you to stop asking to cut. That's not what we're saying, but we have to have an alternative uh, to at least fight them with because they're already they're on they're on the winning ground they have the high ground so to speak and we're still battling uphill and so it is uh you know it, it, we at least need to have a plan B uh, doesn't mean you have to stop asking to cut that's the bottom line all right well let's move on to number two which of course is oil pricing uh, the oil overhang the glut what does it mean for us and of course this new discussion with the G20 holding their meeting on Friday. What does it tell us? Give us the give us the rundown here. So the 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 latest, um, and I checked again this morning to make sure it was still current, and it's and it's it's coming is coming more and more uh, to this point. The 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 proposed solution to um, uh, oil to the oil price is to reduce production. Uh, historically, what's happened is America has relied on the U.S. has relied on others to reduce production. Uh, Saudi uh, and OPEC. Plus, uh, they added Russia uh, a couple of years ago or three years ago uh, to the to the mix to, to maintain price support. Basically, Saudi and Russia are now saying we're not going to do it alone. Uh, the cuts are too deep, um, and and we make more even though we sell even though we sell at a lower price. We make more by keeping production levels up. We make more revenue by keeping production levels up uh, than uh, than than unless we get everybody to cut back. Raise the price um, and, uh, and and do price supports that way, because America, because the U.S. has become such a big producer uh, with shale, uh, both Russia and Saudi are saying you have to make those cuts. We're not Saudi and Russia are saying we're not going to make the cuts. Get the price level up, the deep cuts that have to be made. Get the price level up, and then watch America reap all the benefits by keeping its production levels up. If you want price levels back up, you America have to be part. Uh, of the solution, and that's something that, frankly, America has never done before as a as as a nation. Um, we have done it. We Texas did it um, through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, Texas was such a huge player; it's sort of the OPEC of the day. Uh, that when it would uh, cut back on production, which the Texas Railroad Commission, the, the regulatory agency there, could do, uh, it would have an effect on price. It would it would it would result in price support. But but Texas, though it's a big player. Texas isn't enough um, uh, to do this because you have shale coming from other places as well, um, and so and so America, what 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 the Saudis and the Russians are saying at least to this point, is is from a national perspective, America, you have to make those production cuts. President Trump, you have to order those production cuts, cuts, which he could do, which there's a sufficient federal authority for the for the president to do. And that's where Alaska sort of gets 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 roped into this. Right now, we're sort of sitting out there to the side, um, uh, suffering from uh, uh, price drops, but we would benefit from from production cuts elsewhere that helped elevate the price. We just keep on keeping on uh, with uh, with our production levels and and enjoy the enjoy the benefits of that. We're not running into the same sort of storage issues. Uh, for, there's a good article in the in the ADN, I think. Um, or K2 News. Uh, anyway, there, there's a there's a there's a good story where Larry Persley sort of describes the supply chains, the logistics chain for Alaska oil, and we're not subject to those same sort of <clears throat> same sort of problems that others are running into in terms of storage limitations. Right. But if there were national production cuts, if there were if 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 President Trump responded and said we're going to make production cuts, Alaska would be impacted. Right. I mean, this article from Persili, or this article from KTUU that, that quotes Persili talks about how our oil is still going to refineries on the West Coast, and when the the demand drops like this, all they do is they cut their international imports instead, and Alaska still is strong. But the problem is, again, the price is still pretty low, so it's not a guaranteed. We still have other problems that are attached to this, but it basically means that for the future, Alaska revenue is going to be in a tough situation. About thirty seconds, Brad. Yeah, in a tough situation, unless 
they're able to put together uh, production cuts that, that raise the price. And it looks like right now that it would take U.S. involvement and that would impact Alaska uh, because we would have national restrictions on production levels. Yep, absolutely. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're up against the uh, break, so we're out of time for today. Brad, thanks for uh, joining us. We appreciate you being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.